All right, guys, uh, welcome back to part two of our Modernism screencast. Uh, where I left off, I left you off with this quote from Gertrude Stein, who was a modernist writer we might look at later, to uh, Ernest Hemingway. That's our boy right there with the mustache, Hemingway, hanging out with his buddies probably in France. That's where a lot of them like to hang out. Uh, specifically, Paris was a big uh, scene for these uh, post-World War I modernist writers. They were drinking, they were hanging out, they were writing. Uh, but a lot of them, like Gertrude Stein said, had a little bit of uh, PTSD from the war, felt a little bit lost. Let's look at uh, Ernest Hemingway. I'm going to have you read a little bit of his stuff today. Uh, here's a picture of him, a couple older pictures. As you can see, he uh, liked to box. He was kind of a manly man. Uh, that was his whole deal. He liked to box. He liked to go deep sea fishing. He liked to... Uh, go big game hunting, lots of adventuring, uh, this Ernest Hemingway. And uh, he summed up the values of many post-World War I writers, uh, and he had some very specific elements of his style. He had a spare, this means a uh, plain writing style, didn't use a lot of huge adjectives and descriptive language, it was very simple. And he had a new kind of hero, a disillusioned hero, but who was also honorable and courageous. He said one way to describe his hero is that, hero is that often they displayed grace under pressure. Uh, if you can almost think of the deer slayer, someone that's really tough, but add to that kind of a view of the world that nothing really matters. Uh, that's kind of a, a similar type of idea of Hemingway. They're tough, but they are kind of world wary. Uh, here's a quote, uh, or actually, no, I'll get to that quote in a second. Uh, here's, uh, I was talking about how many of these expatriate writers, they called, Hem Hemingway was one of the big ones, lived in Paris during parts of the 1920s. Uh, it was cheaper to live there. There was a really cool scene going on. They could party. There's lots of history. And uh, they could uh, kind of afford to live there. And a lot of them had been over in Europe because of the war. They were soldiers, so they are kind of used to this European living. Some other famous people that ended up uh, in uh, Paris or in Europe, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who uh, struck up a relationship with Ernest Hemingway. We'll read him when we read The Great Gatsby. Gertrude Stein, who I mentioned before. John Dos Passos, another important writer. Sherwood Anderson, Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound is actually very important. We'll talk about him more to come. Uh, he's a poet and was also a, an editor for a lot of these big writers. Uh, some famous works by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, the Sun Also Rises was his first big book. Uh, it's about these people uh, living in Paris, these expatriate uh, type of writers. Uh, a Farewell to Arms was his World War I book. That's also a great one. For Whom the Bell Tolls was about the Spanish Civil War. And then he had a bit of a comeback later in life. In 1951, he published The Old Man and the Sea, and he, then he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. So... Uh, he had a long uh, career and a lot of books he wrote. These are just a few, uh, but he's quite prolific in his output of books. Here's a little example of his writing. This is from the novel From Whom the Bell Tolls, and I want to point out a couple of things that you'll notice about uh, his writing. Let's read it. The young man, whose name was Robert Jordan, was extremely hungry, and he was worried. He was often hungry, but he was not usually worried because he did not give any importance to what happened to himself, and he knew from experience how simple it was to move behind the enemy lines in all this country. A couple things you'll notice about this quote. Number one, you don't need a dictionary to read it. It's pretty simply worded. It's not hard to read. Uh, that's part of his spare, plain style. Also, I want you to notice, uh, if I can get my cursor to move here, look at this. He was extremely hungry. He was not often hungry. Look at that repetition. We have this. He was not usually worried. He was, he was worried. These kind of repetition is something you're going to see a lot in his uh, style. We'll talk about it after Soldier's Home of what it kind of means. Uh, but also, look at the way this guy feels. He didn't give any importance to what happened to himself. This is the kind of grace under pressure. He's going to go do something hard, but he doesn't care about himself because he's tough. Uh, and in a certain degree, he's got that kind of lost generation nothing really matters kind of mindset to him. So this is very indicative of the way Hemingway wrote. It's a long book for whom the bell tolls, but it's very good. I uh, recommend it. All right. Back at home uh, in the States, uh, the 1920s uh, was called the Jazz Age. 
These, the Jazz Age is actually a term coined by a writer we're going to look at, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, sometimes it's called the Roaring Twenties, but it demonstrated a break with traditional values. Remember, people are coming home from the war. They're saying, you know, society's changing. Lots of things are happening. There's Things are becoming more modern. We have more modern technology. Social roles are changing. There's a lot that's going on. Here's some things that were characterizing the decade. The bootlegger, the speakeasy, the cocktail, the short-skirted flapper. Here's some flappers right here. Rhythms of jazz music, the gangster. And you can see a lot of these things are not only breaking tradition, but the law. Gangsters, and what were gangsters making money off of? Well, they were bootlegging alcohol, because what was alcohol in the 1920s? It was illegal during Prohibition. What are speakeasies? speakeasies? They're illegal bars. What are cocktails? Those are mixed drinks. A mix of uh, liquor with some sort of uh, flavored uh, liquid like uh, soda or juice that would make it taste better. Why were the cocktails uh, popular in the 1920s? Well, the big reason is that sometimes the only liquor you could get was made in somebody's bathtub and it tasted horrible, so you had to mix it with something so you could drink it down and enjoy it. So and there the cocktail was born. Now, there's a lot of disillusionment about the American dream during this period. So in the 1920s, the after effects of the Great War caused a sense of disillusionment at home, especially concerning the idea of the American dream. Then, after the 20s, you get the 30s, where you have the Great Depression hit. And this shattered the idea that a man or woman could achieve whatever they wanted if only they worked hard for it. Remember, that's kind of the American dream itself. If you work hard enough, you can do anything. Well, in the 1930s, there wasn't enough work for people. So it really did affect the way people viewed this idea of the American dream. Now, the greatest writer about the American dream, I think it's safe to say, is F. Scott Fitzgerald. And the, his written work that best talks about the American dream, criticizes it, celebrates it at the same time, is The Great Gatsby. A wonderful novel, uh, really a magical novel, uh, one that I'm looking forward to having you read. And this was his great work. Uh, it satirized the 1920s and seriously questioned the prevalent ideas about the American dream. You know, so it's Gerald himself. We'll learn more about him, but it's he who coined the term the Jazz Age. Here's a quote from The Great Gatsby. I want to point out some stuff to you about how, number one, you're going to notice its uh, style is a lot different than Hemingway. This is not simple language. This is quite poetic, quite descriptive. But look for the presence of the American dream here. It's, it's quite a beautiful uh, passage. He's talking about looking at the island of Long Island in New York on the eastern seaboard, thinking about the people that first came to settle it from Europe. And this is what he wrote. I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face, for the last time in history, with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. What we see here is them looking at the new world, America, and seeing that this was a place where they were face to face with something, and he says maybe the last time in history that was commensurate or big enough for this sailor's capacity for wonder, meaning this new world is a place where you can make dreams come true. This is finally a place that's fresh, that's new, the fresh green breast of the new world. It doesn't have all the rules of the old world in Europe. Here's where you can finally do what you want to do. This is America, and it's a beautiful place where dreams come true. This is what he's saying here, or at least because Fitzgerald always has two sides to his writing, at least what people might have seen when they first saw it, not necessarily what it was going to deliver. Well, after this celebration of the Jazz Age in the 1920s, we get the Great Depression. Now, a lot of you know these facts. I don't have to go into it a lot, but the Great Depression started in 1929 when the stock market crashed, leading to the Great Depression. We had anywhere from one-fourth to one-third of American workers out of work and unemployed. People waited in bread lines. They foraged for food in garbage dumps. They slept in sewer pipes. They lived in tents and shacks called Hoovervilles, making fun of the president, Herbert Hoover. And of course, 
adding to the disillusionment created by World War I, you had this kind of defeat of the American dream. And this is adding into that kind of feeling of disillusionment about what it means to be American and uh, what life was like. At the same time as people were uh, feeling this way, writers were experimenting more and more with uh, writing styles. And uh, one specific writing style we're going to look at as we continue to read is the idea of stream of consciousness. Let me give you a little background. So a guy that was starting to become more and more popular in the arts is Sigmund Freud, and he opened the workings of the unconscious mind. The uh, interest in his idea of psychoanalysis started to cause anxiety over the amount of freedom an individual really had. You see, he believed that we had parts of our mind that were unconscious, that were doing things or really making us make decisions that we didn't even, we weren't even aware of. Now, when people thought, oh, there's a part of my mind, the subconscious, that I don't even know what's going on, this is kind of scary. Uh, do we even have free will? Are we making our decisions? How does the mind work? It's crazy. So stream of consciousness writing has some connection to this. Writers dive into what thought looks like. What does it actually look like in there in our brains? When you write something, you think about it, you edit it, you really present it to the world. Can we present somehow the more of the raw thought form in our writing? This was what came out as this literary technique called stream of consciousness. And here's our definition for it. This writing style abandoned chronology and attempted to imitate the moment-by-moment -moment flow of a character's perceptions and memories. Uh, probably the greatest writer concerning stream of consciousness is the Irish writer James Joyce. Uh, he radically changed the very concept of the novel by using stream of consciousness in his novels, The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and his modernist masterpiece, Ulysses. Here's a picture of him. Look at this guy. How cool is he? Why is he wearing an eye patch? Well, he had bad eyes. He was terminally pretty much unhealthy. But he is thought of as one of the most interesting, greatest writers of all time. He was Irish, so we're taking a little trip away from America. But he was so influential that it was important to talk about him. And he was a master of the stream of consciousness style. I finally finished reading his book, Ulysses, last year. It was my third attempt, and I finally made it through. It's about seven, eight hundred pages of stream of consciousness. Not all of it's extremely tough, but look at this passage from it and see if you want to read a whole book that has parts like this in it. Morose delectation, Aquinas Tunbelly calls this. Frate Porscopino, unfallen Adam, rode and not rutted. Call away, let him, thy corn's dainty is. Language no whit worse than his monk words. Merry beads jabber on their girdles. Rogue words, tough nuggets patter in their pockets. That was from a excerpt of Ulysses by James Joyce. The whole novel isn't written like this. If it was, people would probably have a lot more tough time reading it, but a lot of parts are like this, so it's hard. Now, what this quote's trying to do is it has all of these things that the character is thinking about. He doesn't explain why these phrases come into his mind. He knows, because if he's saying Latin, like Frate Porscapino, the person thinking about it probably knows what, it, what that means. They know what this term, like horns dainty, is. Our job is to either look it up or start to understand that this person has a very particular mind. In this case, it's a guy named Stephen Dedalus. So this is an example of somebody jumping into someone's mind with stream of consciousness writing. We have a wonderful stream of consciousness writer in American literary history. His name is William Faulkner. I'm going to introduce William Faulkner to you later, but I think I'll end the screencast for now because we want to jump into him before we read uh, his story, uh, A Rose for Emily. So for now, I'm going to sign off and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon and enjoy reading your Ernest Hemingway tonight.